People are very afraid of the police. That is a big part of our culture. Don't matter how rich you are, how old you are. We're just afraid of them. We got, we got every reason to be afraid of them. You know what I mean? Like, you're a white lady. You ever been pulled over before? You know, and what they say, let me see your driver's license and your registration, right? See? See, I'm just guessing. <laughs> That's not what they say to us. <laughs> well, you wouldn't believe what they say to us. Spread your cheeks and lift your sack. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> Excuse me? You heard me spread open your cheeks and lift your sack. I got a driver's license, too. There's easier ways to prove who I am and shit. As a black man, I have to deal with an extra layer of bullshit on top of regular life. That's why when I get in my car, it's one, buckle seatbelt, two, adjust mirrors, and three, nigga, check for cops. If I see any cops in my vicinity, I'm getting the fuck up off that street. Where are we? Exactly am I. Between light and shadow. Hey guys, this is Craig, and you've tuned into Between Light and Shadow, a Twilight Zone podcast. Okay, so my wife Teresa got a new phone a few days ago. The Samsung Galaxy 10 Plus, if you care about such things. I'm an LG man myself. I'm currently rocking the LG V40, which I'm extremely happy with. So after we had dinner the other night, she asked me to call her phone. Now, I assumed she was just checking to make sure her contacts transferred over from her old phone properly. So I called her. And to my surprise and delight, her phone emitted a very familiar tune. That's right, she assigned a unique ringtone to me, and it's the Twilight Zone theme. Actually, I'm kind of surprised that she didn't do that years ago, but it's still pretty cool, right? I think maybe I'll keep her around after all. Hey! Ah, oh, man, I'm gonna pay for that later. Just forget it. I don't know what I was thinking. Just forget, take it back, 10 seconds, and let's live in that time. What if, just what if, that was a viable option? We live in an age of pausing, skipping, backing up, fast forwarding, whatever type of media we're consuming. We've actually had this ability for decades, but only when it came to music. You can move the needle on a record to replay a song or to skip a song. You can rewind or fast forward a tape. You can do the same with CDs, but with them, you have the added functionality, at least with some players, of programming the tracks to play in a different order. The advent of the VCR allowed us, for the first time, to manipulate what we were watching. I think I was 13, maybe 14 when we got our first VCR, and it was like having some kind of godlike control over time and space. I was no longer a slave to time slots and commercial breaks. I could just fast forward through them. Now, this did require, however, that I pre-record whatever I was watching, but that was a minor inconvenience. This ability, this power, took a giant leap forward when DVRs were invented. They could still record shows, just like VCRs could, but they also had a built-in buffer, which meant that you could pause live TV. You could rewind live TV. Did you... Miss a joke on that episode of Will and Grace because your dog or your kid or any number of things distracted you? Just hit that back button on your remote and suddenly you're 10 seconds in the past. Now, this technology is commonplace now and it has absolutely changed how we watch TV and films. There have actually been times when I've been in a movie theater and I wanted to back it up to see something again and I've actually reached for the remote, which isn't there, of course. Same thing has happened in the car. If I'm listening to the radio and I want to hear something again, I'll reach up as if to hit the back button, which isn't there, of course. Now, 
I haven't reached for the remote to rewind, say, something in real life, like a conversation or something I missed when I blinked at the wrong moment. But what if I could? What if I could rewind my life every time I said something I shouldn't have or did something that I immediately regretted? You know, to get me out of trouble with the wife or whatever? Don't think I haven't wished for that ability. And I'm betting every single person listening has too. Lots of times, I'm guessing. After the new Twilight Zone series premiered with back-to-back episodes on April 1st, 2019, the show settled into its regular time slot on April 11th. Well, I guess time slot doesn't necessarily apply, since it airs on CBS All Access. I guess airs doesn't really apply either, since CBS All Access is a streaming service and not an actual television channel. But content delivery details aside, the episode in question is Replay, written by Selwyn Seifu Hines and directed by Gerard McMurray. The very first shot of the episode gives us our very first E is for egg! The Busy Bee Diner is a clear reference to the Busy Bee Cafe from the original series episode Nick of Time. And as we'll see, that's not the only connection between that episode and this one. Having lunch inside the diner are Nina Harrison and her son Dorian. They're on a road trip to Tennyson University, where he's starting his freshman year of college. And the college is near Earliesville, Virginia, where Nina grew up. Not entirely happily, it turns out. Well, Uncle Neil, his grandpa was proud of. Your Uncle Neil doesn't know shit. My daddy didn't help me get out, and I didn't care to stay, so neither of us cared about what each other wanted. She pulls out an old camcorder that belonged to her father. E is for egg! Eagle-eyed viewers, or I guess anyone paying attention, will notice that the camcorder is made by Whipple Industries, the same fictional company that made the MP3 player seen in the previous episode, Nightmare at 30,000 Feet. But that's not why it triggered another Easter egg alert, since I promised last time to limit those to original series callbacks. The very name Whipple is a reference to the original series episode, The Brain Center at Whipple's. And now to the stunning and exciting news, which I believe you'll agree shows once again that at Whipple's, we only take forward steps. I have some questions for the bonus features of Dorian Goes to College. Tell us about how your gorgeous mama took you to school so you could become the next Ryan Coogler. What you know about Ryan Coogler anyway? What you think? I live under a rock? That's not Black Panther. <laughs> Dorian accidentally squirts ketchup on himself, leaving a big red splotch on his chest. A clever bit of foreshadowing. Oh, damn. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. Was, was that on? Did you just record that just now? Yeah, so my future granddaughter can see what a slob I had to live with. Could you rewind and record over, please? <laughs> I was going to be on Facebook. Nina hits the rewind button to back the tape up. And somehow time itself is rewound a few seconds. Tucked inside the quick montage that represents time rewinding, we get another... E is for egg! Blink and you'll miss a quick shot of one of the most iconic objects in the entire five-year run of the classic series, the Mystic Seer fortune-telling machine slash napkin dispenser, also from the classic episode Nick of Time. The background is blurred, so it's hard to tell where exactly it's placed in the diner. I rewatched all the diner scenes a few extra times, looking for another glimpse of it, but I didn't spot it. Does anything exciting ever happen around here? 
it is quite possible. One of the crown jewels of my Twilight Zone collection is a life-size, fully functioning replica of the Mystic Seer prop, which was released by Biff Bang Pow a few years back. Now, in studying a screen grab of the one used here, I'm 99% sure it's the exact same one I have. I mean, not the exact one. I, You know what I mean. Dorian goes to put ketchup on his fries, just like he did before, and Nina stops him, having retained the memory of the ketchup incident. Meanwhile, a police officer named Lasky watches them from the counter as he chows down his chicken fried steak. Lasky, by the way, was a street name in the first episode of the new series, The Comedian. Now, I get why this new show is dropping references to the original series, though I'm mystified why they're doing it so damned often. But why are the new episodes referencing details in other new episodes? On a complete side note, each time we see through the camcorder's point of view, we see that it's shooting at 30 frames per second. And my first thought was, aha, mistake. No tape-based camcorder can shoot in 30p. The first camcorder I had that could do that was released in 2008, but it wasn't tape-based. It had a hard drive in it. However, According to my research, JVC was the first company to release a consumer-level tape-based camcorder capable of shooting at 30 frames per second in 2003. So clearly, I'm not as erudite on the subject of videography as I purport myself to be. Presenting Nina Harrison, a woman who left her past behind to provide a better future for her son. Today, however, she will have no choice but to revisit history again and again on a fateful drive through the perilous highways of the Twilight Zone. Jordan Peele is sitting in a booth across the diner reading a newspaper as he delivers his opening comments. And here's another... E is for egg! The headline on the newspaper reads... New experimental rocket crashes outside of Reno, Nevada, which is a reference to the events in the classic episode, I Shot an Arrow into the Air. Nina and Dorian leave the diner and hit the road. Dorian is driving. He wants to stop in Earliesville and visit his uncle Neil, Nina's estranged brother, but she's not having it. He picks up the old camcorder and playfully starts filming her. <laughs> A quick blast of a police siren heard behind them kills the levity, and both of them stiffen up. This is America, after all. Black Americans have learned to fear that sound. Dorian puts the camera down and pulls over. It's Officer Lasky from the diner, who apparently followed them. He quickly notices the telltale red light on the camcorder. Is that device recording? Um... Turn off that camera now. Why? She has the right to film. Turn it off! He reaches inside the car to grab the camera. Sensing that this can't possibly end well, Nina hits the rewind button. And suddenly, there are a few moments in the past, before Lasky pulls them over. Nina has what amounts to a panic attack, prompting Dorian to pull the car over. Then, Lasky shows up. Dorian pleads with him to get emergency assistance for his mother, but Lasky has other ideas. Do you folks have an emergency? Yes, please, officer. My mom, she needs help. She needs to get to the hospital. Okay. Your vehicle is in violation of state code. You see how this portion of the vehicle is out on the highway? It needs to be moved right now. I'm oh, sorry, did you hear what I said? I did. And I will address your situation once you've complied with my demand to reposition your vehicle. Did Dorian. you just say that? Dorian. Huh? My mom needs to find a hospital. Dorian. Fuck the car. Dorian. Things escalate quickly, and just as Lasky is about to tase Dorian, Nina hits rewind again. This time, she holds the button down a bit longer, and suddenly they're back in the diner. Shaken, she insists that they leave immediately, hoping they can get further away this time before Lasky finishes his lunch. And this time, she's driving, and she has an idea. Can we just find a motel, get off this shitty road, and just put an end to this day? so close to the school though i know i know i i could use a good night's sleep i don't want to drive back alone i'm not feeling too great why don't we just watch some bad reality tv eat some junk food and just hang out it's our last night together okay 
the name of the hotel? E is for egg. It's the old Cadwallader Inn. Cadwallader's my name. At least it's the name I'm using this month. Has a nice feeling on the tongue. Cadwallader. Cadwallader was, of course, the devil himself in the classic episode Escape Clause. So that's two devil-centric Easter eggs. Wait, does that make them deviled eggs? Little Easter humor for you there. So Nina and Dorian check into the Cadwallader Inn, and things seem okay. They watch TV, they joke around, but then... Lasky shows up at the door. I need to see pieces of identification from the both of you. Mine is in my purse. Why do we need to show our ID? Because I asked you. It's not sufficient grounds. I know my rights. Dorian. His is in his wallet, in his back pocket. Mom, why do we need to show him when we haven't done anything? We got a 911 call about a noise complaint at this motel. <laughs> I should be calling 911 on you for coming here with your bullshit. Predictably, things escalate again. Lasky slams Dorian against the wall, shattering the glass of a framed painting. Nina hits rewind again, and once again, they're back at the diner. Realizing that running from Lasky always has the same result, she tries a different approach. Good afternoon, Officer Lasky. May I buy you a piece of apple pie? What for? For your service. Mabel does make the best apple pie this side of anywhere. <laughs> Can't turn down that. They talk, and things seem pleasant enough. It feels like maybe she's diffused the situation. But the episode's only halfway over, so probably not. As Nina and Dorian go to leave the diner, Lasky proves that the piece of pie and pleasant conversation isn't enough to stop his racist power tripping. By the way... Does that Volvo outside belong to you? That's a nice car. How'd you get that car? I worked hard for that car, Officer Lasky. And to get my son into college, so he could have opportunities that I didn't. We all want that for our kids, don't we? Yes, ma'am. Drive safe. They head for the car, with Lasky hot on their heels. At this point, we get a glimpse of the license plate number on Lasky's police cruiser. 01015 1015 1015 was a recurring and important number in Nightmare at 30,000 Feet. Its presence here suggests that it holds some significance outside that episode. I guess we'll see the further we get into this new series. I need to see your driver's license, registration, and proof of ownership of that vehicle. Ownership? You mean the pink slip? Who keeps that pink slip in their car? Well, Hopefully you do, or you are not driving this vehicle out of this parking lot. This is my car. Mom, why wouldn't it be my car, huh? Tell me, why wouldn't it be my car? Put down what's in your hand. It's a camera. Ma'am? This is my car, and I am driving my Mom, car. Mom, wait, stop. I've got a picture parking. of the pink slip on my phone. You why wouldn't this be wait, my car? Wait, who has a copy of their pink slip on their phone? This detail seems to exist solely for the purpose of getting Dorian to pull out his phone, which is kind of clunky. Anyway, Dorian holds up his phone to show Lasky the proof. All Lasky sees is a black kid pointing something at him, and since he's clearly looking for a reason, he draws his weapon and fires. Dorian is dead. Nina must identify the body. I had... I need... There was a, a camera. An old camcorder. Who has it? Where is it? I need it. The medical examiner manages to procure the camera for her, which is kind of odd since it's a recording device that would undoubtedly be considered vital evidence in a shooting incident. Feels like another clunky plot expedience detail. Dorian whipping out his phone in front of a trigger-happy cop was one thing, but this is kind of ridiculous. I expect this kind of disregard for actual real-world procedure and protocol in a 25-minute show like the original Twilight Zone, but this episode is 45 minutes and change. They had plenty of time to craft this piece of the story differently for believability's sake. So Nina rewinds time yet again, and she and Dorian are back in the diner. She rushes them out and gets back on the road. 
It seems no matter what she tries, she can't escape Lasky, at least not on her own. She tells Dorian about the magic camcorder, and he suggests that they go see his uncle Neil in Earliesville. Despite her reservations, she agrees. As they drive into Earliesville, we get a clear shot of the back of their car, and... E is for egg! Their license plate reads 2D-7876. This was the same plate number on Nan Adams' car in the classic episode, The Hitchhiker. I think this camcorder is magic, and it rewinds time or something. And there's this cop. I've tried everything, but he keeps just pulling us over again and again and again. No matter what route we take, no matter how nice or how mean we are, he's always there. There's nothing I can do. We can't get past him. He always shows up. He's always on the verge of killing Dorian. The last time... I get it. I believe you. Not only does Neil believe her, he's actually got a way they can get Dorian safely to the college campus. There's an old draining system that leads into the college that was built in the 1700s. Now, it was closed up before they drew up this map in like 55 or so. Dad used to work down there in the summers. He used to take me down there sometimes to scare me. They make their way through the tunnel, which conveniently leads right to Tennyson University. And oh, before I forget... E is for egg! The Tennyson in Tennyson University is likely a reference to the character Jamie Tennyson in the classic episode, The Silence. Now, just when Dorian seems safely delivered, Lasky arrives, with a few units in tow for backup. But Uncle Neil and Mama Nina stand between them and Dorian, and very quickly things escalate to a standoff, with Lasky and friends holding our trio of protagonists at gunpoint. Things look pretty bleak. Nina raises the camcorder. Wind it, Mom. Let's try again. Not this time, Dorian. She hits the record button. And then, something amazing happens. A mass of other students gather behind them, all armed with camera phones to document the event. You think you can intimidate me with a camcorder? Don't you watch the news? And then, Nina lets Lasky have it. You've crossed the line. Harassing us. Abusing authority. You've been profiling us, targeting us, following us, shooting us, killing us. Mm -mm, Not anymore. Now we cross the line. My son will cross that gate. Right now, right here. My son will go to college. So back the fuck up! The other officers lower their weapons, but Lasky keeps his trained on Nina. He trembles with rage. I see it now, Officer Lasky. You're the one who's really afraid. Go on, Dorian. Walk through that gate. Lasky finally holsters his weapon and leaves. And suddenly, we're ten years into the future. Dorian now has a daughter of his own, and Grandma Nina still has that camcorder. In fact, it looks like she's never without it. Don't you think you can put that down now, Mom? Sure don't. Dorian, you know why I do this. It's been ten years. It's enough. She reluctantly sets the camcorder down. The kid gets a hold of it and, being clumsy like all little kids, promptly drops it. (gasps) Nina watches in horror as it breaks apart into several pieces as it crashes against the hardwood floor. E is for egg! Now, this may have been visible earlier, but this is when I noticed that there's a phrase inscribed on the side of the camcorder, Dis a la propriétaire. That exact phrase was also inscribed on the side of the enchanted camera in the original series episode, A Most Unusual Camera. Yeah, but what do you do after your 10 pictures? Is there any other way to get more film? Well, we've only had it for a little while. what do you say? Yeah, what do you say about 10 pictures? Well, the inscription reads, Dis à la propriétaire. 
that means 10 to an owner. Well, I presume that means you may only take 10. That camera took pictures of events five minutes in the future, and yeah, the user was limited to 10 pictures. Does that mean that Nina's father's camcorder could only rewind time 10 times? I think Nina only does it maybe five times in the episode. But if she's held onto the camera all this time, then I guess maybe she used it another five times, so now it's all used up? I don't know. Dorian leaves on an emergency ice cream errand. Hey, that's a real thing. Ask my wife and kid. And Jordan Peele takes us out. Nina Harrison found that only by embracing her past could she protect her son's future. And it was love, not magic, that kept evil at bay. But for some evils, there are no magical permanent solutions, and the future remains uncertain. Even here, in the Twilight Zone. As we're hearing the closing comments, we see what appear to be police lights flashing across Nina's face. And when the picture cuts to black, we hear... Where do I start? I can happily report that this third episode of the new series represents a significant improvement after what I would call a truly rocky start. There's a lot to like here. For starters, the performances are uniformly excellent. One thing this new series has is a lot of talented actors. Nina is played by Sana Latham, who may be remembered by genre fans for her appearances in 1998's Blade and 2004's AVP, Alien vs. Predator. Her longest-running gig to date was the four seasons she provided the voice of Donna Tubbs on the animated series The Cleveland Show. Listen up! This training will not be easy, it will not be fun, and it will not be over until I am satisfied! Sounds like our honeymoon. Out. What was that for? This fight is happening whether you want it to or not, and you have got to be ready. When I was on the Foxy Boxing Circuit, if some bitch came at me, I didn't care if I was in the ring, backstage, nursery school parking lot, she got some of this. Dorian is played by British actor Damson Idris, best known in the U.S. for his work in the FX original series Snowfall, which will start its third season later this year. In the role of Uncle Neil is Steve Harris, who's been in tons of stuff in his near 35-year career. He's probably best known for the eight seasons he co-starred on TV's The Practice from 1997 through 2004. But I just want to point out that, like Sana Lathan, he's got some animated TV cred. He provided the voice of Detective Ethan Bennett, a.k.a. Clayface, on The Batman from 2004 to 2006. You don't get it, do you? Joker didn't just melt my skin, he melted my mind. I'm a freak inside and out. And Chief Rojas has zero tolerance for the likes of me. You okay? You sound horrible. Throat's a little raw. You know, from all the screaming last night. And finally, the thoroughly detestable Officer Lasky is brought to disgusting life by Glenn Fleshler who played the even more disgusting and detestable serial killer Errol Childress in the first season of HBO's True Detective in 2014. My family's been here a long, long time. The cinematography doesn't necessarily call attention to itself. The other episodes we've seen so far have been a bit more stylized, but it more than gets the job done. Gotta love that extreme close shot of that snail on the roadside. Maybe it's a metaphor for the glacial pace at which society overcomes its inherent racial prejudice, and perhaps its corresponding fear of change. Or maybe it's just a snail. I don't know. I think Replay is definitely a success. It's far and away the best that the new series has presented so far. But having said that, I do have some notes. You knew I would, right? A 
Other than the plot expedience sloppy details I talked about before, I think the episode loses quite a bit of its footing in its second half. Now the first half is marvelous. That mounting tension, the complete and utter dread that gradually dawns upon Nina as she realizes that there is no escaping this tragedy that she cannot figure out a way around. Now, had this been a half-hour episode, and had her attempt to make peace with Lasky worked, therefore averting the shooting and saving Dorian, then the intervention of the camcorder's time-rewinding magic would have served a clear point, and it would have ended things on a hopeful note. It would have presented a victory for level-headedness and simple kindness in the face of blind, unreasoning hatred. That's a great message, right? It would have also humanized Lasky. He would have had an actual arc. There could have been an actual human being under that scary racist cop. But that's obviously not the direction they took, because that's not the story they wanted to tell, and Lasky is ultimately presented as nothing more than a two-dimensional evil antagonist. The second time I watched it, this made more sense to me. The first time through, I was looking for Easter eggs and following the plot. Other than making note of the obvious racial themes, I didn't really even try to get inside the characters. But the second time, I knew what was coming. The Easter egg hunt was already done, so I was free to devote my attention to Nina and Dorian and Lasky. And what I realized was, there's a reason Lasky is portrayed as nothing short of evil incarnate. Because this story is being told through the lens of the black experience in America, and not just in the historical sense. If a black person gets pulled over on the highway by a white cop, they aren't thinking about who this cop is, and maybe why he's the way that he is. They're thinking that they could very well get murdered right there in their car. This is real. It probably doesn't sound real to those of us who don't deal with injustice and mistrust and hateful prejudice every day, but it is real. And how could the black community not view law enforcement as a soulless threat when law enforcement has so horrifically betrayed them so many times? Lasky may seem almost cartoonish the way he's drawn, like a T-1000 in relentless pursuit, but in the context of a morality tale told from the Black perspective, it makes perfect sense. It is a bit of a missed opportunity, though, that we got that glimpse of the mystic seer early in the episode. If the intent was to suggest that there's perhaps a satanic influence behind Lasky's unyielding racial prejudice, they probably should have done a bit more with it. The single glimpse only serves as a quick eye-winking callback. It could have been so much more had the narrative maybe taken a slightly different direction. They could have set this in Ohio and had it be the exact same Busy Bee Cafe from Nick of Time, still under the spell of that fortune-telling machine. I don't know, would Ohio be a believable place for this kind of palatial racial targeting? See, I don't even know tucked away up here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm safe and warm behind multiple layers of physical and socioeconomic bubbles. The narrative just falls apart in a number of ways in its second half. It seems that the magic camcorder's modus operandi isn't just to keep rewinding time, its larger mission appears to be to essentially force Nina into facing her unhappy childhood, forcing her to return to her hometown, forcing her to reconnect with her estranged brother. The problem is, that's not really developed enough. We just get bits and pieces. Why'd you never come back? My older brothers lost their lives here. Your uncle was shot a block over there. To me, there were only two ways out of here, walking out and never looking back or dead. So her brother stayed in Earliesville, fighting the good fight. You can't miss the Black Lives Matter poster hanging in his house while she ran away and never looked back, essentially leaving him holding the family bag. Is it the narrative's view that she was wrong to leave? She grew up in an area rife with violence. Her other two brothers died under violent circumstances, and she presumably ran like hell rather than raise her own child in that environment. This was wrong of her to do? She's what we would typically consider a success story. She came from humble, unhappy beginnings and became a successful attorney. She raised Dorian on her own, and from what we can see, she did a pretty damn good job of it. 
If she left Earliesville to protect Dorian from the violence that she grew up around, which would make perfect sense, why would the Twilight Zone force her to go back? It's interesting that Neil is so quick to believe her story about the camcorder. It's almost as if he already knows its power. That might have added an interesting dimension, a bit of richness to the family history. I'm starting to believe more and more in all that stuff the old folks tell you. you know, all those quiet whispers about those things that our ancestors brought over from the motherland. Now that's the only time in the entire episode that there's any theorizing about how this magic camcorder is able to rewind time, but it's so faint that it barely registers. And not that we need an explanation. The Twilight Zone works best when we don't know the specifics of the mechanism involved. But I don't know, maybe Neil was the executor of their father's estate and he let Nina have the old camcorder, hoping that maybe one day it would somehow bring her back to him. See that would have added weight to this second half. As it is, the whole family drama is sketched so hazily that it's almost impossible to invest in it. It's a testament to the actors that it plays as well as it does. It's still affecting when Neil tells her simply, I believe you. And then they embrace. And you're kind of dead inside if that didn't touch you at least a little. And even though it feels completely out of place in this particular narrative, I love the heist planning vibe of Neil's plan to essentially smuggle Dorian through an old underground tunnel to the college. You three, stop where you are. I think the falsest note in the episode for me is Lasky showing up at the college with virtually no cause and holding the trio at gunpoint. Worse, a few Virginia State Police units show up to back him up. Now, there has been no crime committed whatsoever. It's one thing to pull a black motorist over on the road and trample on their rights because you're a racist asshole and you can, but this? This is so over the top that I actually found myself shaking my head in disbelief. In this latest version of events, Nina and Dorian have had no interactions with Lasky. I think this is probably easy to miss because as we've seen the tension mounting throughout the episode, we might forget that the tension is specific to Nina's experience, Nina's perspective. Each time she rewinds time, everything that's happened has been undone. Everything has been reset. Lasky never pulled them over. He never followed them to the motel. He never shot Dorian. He simply noticed them in the diner. There's no indication that he was even following them after that. I mean, wouldn't he have pulled them over, as he did in every other version of events, if he had been following them? So, he somehow makes the leap that these people, who he has no prior knowledge of, are going to Earliesville, somehow deduces that they went to Uncle Neil's house, then puzzles out that they snuck out to Tennyson University via an underground tunnel and gets there just in time to see them climbing out of the access point. Now, this might play a bit better if Lasky was indeed somehow influenced by the devil in the guise of the mystic seer, or if he was an actual demon himself raising his own special kind of racist hell on earth. It would make sense that he could and would abuse his authority to such a crazy degree, and he would have knowledge a normal human wouldn't have. But since he's in fact just a sad white racist cop whose wife died, not even sure that's relevant since we get no details as to how she died, so there's no connection to draw between his grieving and his racism. It's ludicrous. He saw them in the diner, somehow made huge leaps in logic, and tracked them to the college. To do what, exactly? Surely he knew there would be people everywhere. The simple fact that he drew his weapon with zero cause in front of dozens of witnesses would likely be a career ender. You've crossed the line. Nina's final words to Lasky are undeniably powerful. However, in the very next scene, we're 10 years in the future, where we find her still obsessed with the camcorder, still afraid of what may happen at any moment, which greatly undermines the brave stand she took against Lasky. And worse, when her granddaughter drops and breaks the camera, when she's forced to stop keeping that finger ready to rewind at any time, we find it's all been for nothing. Because as soon as Dorian leaves the house, we see police lights and hear that telltale sound of a siren just outside. And I get it. The point is, one successful standoff with the cops 
isn't going to change history and end racism. And maybe there's a larger message that man will always subjugate and victimize his fellow man. But shit, as the story unfolds, we go from victorious and powerful present Nina to frightened and still traumatized future Nina in mere seconds. It's not all random, though. Since the Big Bang set everything in motion, everything that happens in this universe has to be the way it is. Well, it's true. It's all just particles unfolding the way they're destined to. That's pretty depressing. <laughs> I think it's kind of cool. Things happen, but they happen the way they should. This is dark, man. It's basically saying that we'll never get past the sins of history or the present. That the infinite loop that Nina fought her way out of just gave way to a larger loop from which there is no escape. This is the first screenwriting credit for Selwyn Seifu Hines, typically television executive producer and author. So it's not like he's never written before, but man, there's some clumsy shit going on in this plot, at least in its second half. But again, Replay is still mostly successful, largely due to that brilliant first half and the brilliant work by the cast. I mean, I could list some quibbles about Get Out and Us, but that wouldn't change the fact that I love both films, and they gave me a lot of stuff to think about. Now, Replay doesn't quite work on that level, but it definitely made me think. It definitely challenged me in a few ways that the previous episodes we've seen couldn't hope to. This is the first time in this new series that I actually felt Jordan Peele's imprint. This is what I expected from the very beginning. I'm excited to see what's still to come. So as we make our way through this new series, I'm making a conscious effort to look for echoes of the original series. I don't mean Easter eggs, because obviously there are a ton of them, though not nearly as many this time around, thankfully. I mean story concepts that the new showrunners and writers are gleaning from classic episodes and infusing into the new episodes. The obvious one in replay is the enchanted camera from A Most Unusual Camera, which snaps pictures of events five minutes into the future. And if I ever cover that one on the podcast, you'll hear how much I flip and hate it, even though the core idea is pretty cool. The maybe less obvious one is The Hitchhiker, in which a woman drives cross country with the angel of death in hot pursuit. Lasky is a pretty effective agent of death. He represents the death of not only Nina's son, but the death of her life as she knows it. And I guess we can mention both Death Ship and Come Wander With Me, both of which take place in what appear to be endless loops with the same inevitable tragic outcomes. There's also an episode from the more recent 2002 Twilight Zone series that Replay appears to have taken some inspiration from, the episode Rewind which stars Eddie K. Thomas of American Pie fame. So I said, this is very obviously a Pierre de la Francesca. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Mr. Finch, are you trying to seduce me? Yes, ma'am, I am. As a compulsive gambler who comes into possession of a tape recorder that can rewind time, rather than use it constructively for, say, good. I've been testing this. A tape recorder? No, no, no. This is my edge. Oh, your edge. Yeah, you see, some guys, they read tells, some guys count cards, but I have this, okay? And there is not a house in the world that can beat this. See, my edge. I can go back up to five minutes. Up to five minutes, baby. He uses it to win big at the casino, and for a while it works, until he's brought down by the owner of the casino, who just happens to have his own time-rewinding tape recorder. In chasing the big score, Jonah Beach forgot the one unchanging rule of the game. The house always wins, especially in the Twilight Zone. I mean, it's clearly the same core concept, or at least the same basic enchanted object, but I can't call Replay a ripoff of it any more than I can call Rewind a ripoff of a most unusual camera. The 80s Twilight Zone even got in on the act, sorta. The episode 2020 Vision had a guy who could see into the near future through a crack in his eyeglasses. 
it seems that every iteration of the Twilight Zone is going to bust out some variation on the time-bending object at some point, and I'm not even including the episodes about objects, stopwatches, amulets, what have you, that can freeze time. Future, present, past, could this be the last time I ever see this place? So far in this review, I haven't said a whole lot about the main theme of Replay, racism and its associated violence, outside of describing the specific events in the episode. There's a reason for that. I'm a white American male. I'm uniquely unqualified to discuss it in any meaningful fashion, so I've tried to focus more on the plot than the themes, which, I don't know, isn't necessarily ideal. This is obviously incredibly sensitive subject matter, with centuries of shameful history behind it, and all kinds of current events ripping open those wounds in the present. I had actually planned to have a guest on board this week, my friend Stephanie Griffin, a black American whose perspective I think would have maybe rounded things out quite a bit more. We had some scheduling issues, uh, totally my fault, not hers. So that discussion will have to wait for a future episode. I suspect the topic of race will show up again in this new Twilight Zone series, so maybe a more general discussion versus an episode-specific discussion would work better anyway. So that's something that'll be coming in the near future, probably around the time the 10-episode run wraps up at the end of May. Trembling into new A different kind of view Dancing, diving everywhere. Everywhere. So by the time this installment of the podcast drops, two more episodes of the new Twilight Zone will have premiered. A Traveler and The Wonderkind. Now I haven't watched The Wonderkind yet, but I have watched A Traveler and... <sighs> I think it was probably my least favorite of the new episodes so far. And the thought of devoting an entire podcast to it? <laughs> so I've made an executive decision. I'm not going to do weekly episodes. I'm going to cover the new series on a bi-weekly basis, covering two episodes at a time. Now, if we hit a truly amazing episode, or even a worthwhile episode, like Replay, one that demands a more in-depth review, then I may deviate from that formula. But for now, we're gonna run them down two for one style, which is more in line with our usual format anyway. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Do you have any thoughts, questions, comments, criticisms? Let me have it. Email us at zonepod at gmail.com or seek us out on Facebook. Just search for at zonepod and you'll practically trip over us. And hey, some positive iTunes reviews would be most appreciated. Until next time, kids, remember to be kind and rewind. And as always, play nice. Shadow.